Greeting citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we can meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day today, today, you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Bratterstein, whichever you prefer, and today we're going to be discussing a North Carolina shooting spree that claimed the lives of four people. 19-year-old Mariana Pujar, who was a contestant on America's Next Top Model, her boyfriend, 23-year-old Jonathan Alvarado, 21-year-old Husmar Gonzaga Garcia, and 22-year-old Razul Jalil Harrell. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically, you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. Now, before I get into the details of today's case, I first need to say a big thank you to Skillshare for partnering with me on today's video. And if you're not familiar with Skillshare, don't you worry, you're about to get familiar with Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where lifelong learners can go to learn skills that will benefit them for a lifetime. I have really been loving on Skillshare the last year or so. Like we're in a pretty committed relationship because I find them to be incredibly valuable, valuable, valuable and beneficial to the longevity and health of this channel. Cause I don't know if you know this, you might know this, but I do everything myself here. And somehow, I don't know how, I just woke up and this was like my job. I totally changed career paths after almost a decade as a paralegal. And I feel like you have to learn how to work in this ever changing world. And that's where Skillshare becomes incredibly important to me because they're helping me fine tune skills I already had, but also teach me completely new skills to help me keep up with the new, the new normal that we all live in. If you are anything like me, you will love Skillshare too, because it's an online learning community that offers thousands of classes to a community of members across 150 countries. And they offer these classes in a variety of subjects from classes on things like social media success, productivity, and time management, or what I'm currently most interested in, which is podcasting. They literally have classes on any, anything, anything your heart desires. You will find something on Skillshare that will help you. So recently I started taking this new class called intro to procreate illustrating on an iPad. And that class is taught by Brooke Glasser or Glaser, G-L-A-S-E-R. And I've been really enjoying it because it teaches you, as the title implies, how to use Procreate. And Procreate is what my husband has used traditionally to help me create my merch designs. But I kind of want to take a stab at just doing them myself because I feel like I've got some ideas, but it's hard for me to articulate them. And if I just learned how to do it myself, then I could do it myself. You know what I mean? I think that that could be really, really cool. So that's what I've been most interested in right now. And that's just one of the reasons I personally find Skillshare to be such a beneficial addition to my life. Now, if you were to become a Skillshare member yourself, you would have access to a, a multitude of classes on any subject that your heart has, to, heart has to desire, that your heart desires. And you can do it all at your own pace, which is something that's super important to me, especially as like a new mother, which I'm going to hammer into the ground. I am a mother. And you know, that just means that I don't have a lot of free time. So I can do it whenever I want. And that's important to me. So I have some identity outside of just taking care of another human being. I need to be able to fill up my own cup so I can continuously fill up his cup, his sippy cup over and over all day long, forever. <laughs> So guess what? I have some great news. Skillshare is offering the first thousand members of the Brat Pack who click the link at the top of my description box, the opportunity to peruse all of the classes that Skillshare has to offer for free for one month today. So if all of that sounds as good to you as it does to me, and you want to join a rad community of lifelong learners and delve into some skills that will benefit you for a lifetime, make sure to click the link at the top of the description box to let them know that I'm the one that sent you because it helps my channel and take advantage of all of the classes that Skillshare has to offer for free for one month today. Now I just want to say a big thank you to Skillshare for partnering with me on today's video. It's partners like Skillshare that make it even possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock. Don't ever change. All right. Now that I'm done spreading the good word of Skillshare, we can go ahead and get into this video. Now this video is on a case that you may recognize as a case that I have done before. This is one of the very first videos I did on YouTube. And when I say, wow, it's not good. It's literally, if you go back, it is 11 minutes long. How? That's what I'd like to know is how did I think that was acceptable? When I went back and watched it, I was like, you know what? It's not that bad. Like it gets all, it gets the story told. And, it, and like, I will give myself a little pat on my back for one of my earlier videos. When I rewatched it, I wasn't like, oh wow. I'm just kind of like, I could do better. And it deserves to be told better because there was a lot more information. Um, I don't think this is going to be quite as long as my usual videos because there isn't as much information as other cases go, um, which I have a lot of feelings about. 
like as to why that is, but I knew I could do it better and I wanted to because I told you guys I was planning on redoing some of my older cases, like redoing some of my older videos. And when I thought of what cases I wanted to redo, this is one of the very first ones I thought of. It's a very sad case. It's a case that I don't really think got the compassion that it deserved and that's because drugs are involved, but it's still just as tragic. The people who lost their lives are still just as worthy of being alive and worthy of being mourned and cared for, you know what I mean? So it frustrated me to hear the way some people were talked about in the reportings. And it just, it's, it's horrifying. It started, okay. This is a case that started as a drug robbery that went terribly wrong and turned into a two day murder spree that took the lives of four really young people. So today I'm going to tell you all about it. I read all the things so you do not have to. And at the end of this video, I want you to answer the question of the day. I'm going to give it to you now so you can kind of have it kicking around in your brain as we go through all the details, but I don't want you to answer it obviously until you have like some information to go off of. So the question of the day is this, do you believe that the sentences that were given to the people involved in this case were justice? Let me know all your thoughts after I go through all the details, put all your thoughts in the comments below. This is the first video I'm filming after coming back from the week that I took off when my mom was here for Charlie's birthday. So if I seem off, it's because I've been in front of a camera and like my tongue just do not be working, but I'm going to get through it. And I hope it doesn't suck too much. So let me know. Let me know. <laughs> but anyways, with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the North Carolina spree killing that took the lives of four people. Our story begins in late February of 2016, and this is in Charlotte, North Carolina. Police received a call that led them to the 700 block of Norris Drive. It was just before 5.30 p.m. when police entered the home. And when they first entered, they found that there was money scattered everywhere and it appeared that the house had been ransacked. But it was going to get darker than that because as they looked around the house, they found that there were three bodies in the home. They were kind of in different locations and all of them had been shot to death. These people were 21-year-old Husmar Gonzaga Garcia, his roommate, 23-year-old Jonathan Alvarado, and Jonathan's girlfriend, 19-year-old Mariana Pujar. What police didn't know at this time is that this was just one of two crime scenes that were actually connected because about 10 miles away in Matthews, North Carolina, another man had been shot to death. This was 22 year old Razul Jalil Harrell, and he had been murdered and another man had narrowly lost his life as well. And these shootings were committed by the same culprits. Now, before we get into the specifics of what happened here, I first want to give you a little bit of backstory on the people involved, but unfortunately I'm not able to give you much backstory on anybody. There isn't a lot out there on anyone in this case other than Mariana. And that's because of the fame that she got on America's Next Top Model. And I'm not surprised by this, to be honest. But after reading article after article, I did find myself getting very frustrated because none of them really had anything to say about anyone involved with the exception of Mariana. And when they did talk about them the few times that they did, it just gave me the vibe that the media... How do I even word this properly? I'm not one to get triggered easily. That's not my personality type, but I did get the vibe from reading article after article that the media found that because of the lifestyles that these people lived, that somehow their lives didn't really matter as much. So they didn't talk about them as much. That's the vibe that I got and it was very upsetting to me. So I can tell you little to no information about Jonathan, Uzmar and Razul, but I can give you some backstory on Mariana. Mariana Puhar was born on July 27th, 1995 in a city in Serbia with a population of less than 40,000 people. And she was not born into a peaceful place because at the time that she was born, there was a pretty serious war going on around her. <laughs> pretty serious war. Okay. Uh, it was the Kosovo war and her parents were in constant fear during this time. They really wanted to leave, but had to wait until it was safe to do so. So when Mariana was just five years old, her family made a run for it and fled their country heading for America, where they ended up in New York City with only about $50 in their pockets and an entire family to take care of. So shortly after arriving in New York City, they decided that they wanted to make a change. They didn't want New York City to be like their permanent home. And they went to Charlotte, North Carolina, which was, you know, less intense, quieter, and it had a pretty good sized Serbian community. So they knew that they would feel at home. Her father did odd jobs for a while and got himself very intertwined in the community before finally getting a job as an electrician. And her mom got a job as a waitress, I believe. She worked at a restaurant, I know that much. And they were able to, with those jobs, make ends meet to take care of their family, which consisted of them, Mariana, and her little brother. Now, Mariana was beautiful. I've heard her say that she had like ugly duckling syndrome, but I have such a hard time believing it because if you look at her, she is like clearly a vision. And she definitely had like people dislike her and jealousy growing up because of how beautiful she was, which I totally get because like, I would very much like for her face to be my face. 
Her good looks and her height made her an easy pick for a modeling career, and she loved it. She actually started modeling a little when she was only 12 years old, but got super serious about it at around the age of 17. She went to modeling centers in her hometown of Charlotte, a couple of which she didn't speak like super highly of, but she did get to do runway shows for Charlotte Fashion Week, and that she like really, really enjoyed. She liked doing like the catwalk, you know? Catwalk. Put that base in your walk. That's cover girl. Put that base in your walk head to toe. Okay. Now going back just a little bit, Mariana was like a really good kid through elementary school and middle school. But once she hit high school, that's when things sort of started to change her a little bit. She got in with a crowd that wasn't like the best influence on her. And you know how that, how it goes. She started ditching school, getting into fights. She was enough of a problem that she was on the principal's radar. The principal's like, I know who this girl is and she needs to chill. Direct quote, not direct quote. She would just like go out, party, have fun, do whatever she wanted, but more importantly, not do the things she didn't want to do. And because of that, she decided around the age of 16 that school was not something that she wanted to do anymore. So I think she was halfway through the 10th grade when she just dropped out completely. Now, initially her parents did not know that she had made the decision to, to like quit school, but once they found out they were furious, they were super pissed off, which I think most parents would be, but I feel like it's probably particularly true of a, of a child of immigrant parents, which it could be argued that like all of us technically are immigrants if we're not Native American, but I digress. I could just imagine that it would be so hard for them to see their child not even really trying to live up to the potential they see in them and be the best they could be, especially after going through so much to get them to a better place to give them the opportunities that you didn't have. You know what I mean? I don't know. Let me know if you are in the situation where your parents are immigrants and things like that. Um, because I don't know, but that's the, what I could imagine. Like I've done so much to get you here. Why are you just throwing it away? With that said, her parents did kind of get the, well, I was going to say the happy ending that they wanted, but not really because they lost their child. But for a time, it seemed like things were going well because it didn't take Mariana long to realize that she had made a mistake by dropping out of school. She realized that she didn't want to go down the path that she had been going down. So she started to distance herself from her friends. She started to like work, got herself a job so she could make some money. She was working at retail places like Guess and Abercrombie and Hollister and started working fast foods jobs like McDonald's. And eventually she did enroll in a program and she, like a GED program, but she got her diploma. And this, changing her life, getting her diploma, um, her turning 18, this all happened right around the same time that she got what she thought was going to be her big break. So basically she started taking modeling more seriously when she was 17. And she told herself if she hadn't made it herself by the time she turned 18, she was going to apply to be on America's Next Top Model. And she was 18. The time was up. She went on to CW's website, which is like the network that runs America's Next Top Model. And she filled out an application. She sent in photos and then she did an interview on Skype that went well enough that she was invited to, L to LA to meet with the casting department. The casting director loved her telling her that she had the it, you know, the it. And she was a natural in front of the camera talking to it like she was talking to a friend. And this all paid off because she ended up getting to go on the show and she was super stoked about it. So basically what happened here is Mariana had applied, but she didn't tell her parents that she had applied to be on the show. I think it probably, I mean, I don't know. This is something I'm totally, you know, going off here on what I think. I think that she probably didn't want to tell her parents what was going on until it was for certain so that she could kind of deal with that herself. Like if things went wrong, she wouldn't have to have all of these people that she had already told who were like waiting to find out whether she succeeded or failed. And then she fails and she has to tell them all that she fails. I think she was kind of waiting until the good news happened. So Basically, she found out she was going, she went to her parents and she tells them and they're like, I'm sorry, you're doing what now? And she's like, I'm going to be on America's Next Top Model and I leave in two days. So she had this friend named Belle who was her friend, but also her stylist. And they got together and they picked out a bunch of pieces so that she could take them to LA and be on America's Next Top Model. And I don't know if you guys saw Mariana's season. I definitely did. I remember her very well because she's one of my favorite, like physically, like I told you, like, I think she's so pretty. I was like, oh, you are so pretty. So she stuck out to me, but basically I watched like every season of America's Next Top Model. My husband too. We both like America's Next Top Model, RuPaul's Drag Race, all of that. I mean, it definitely has a new lens. Like when you look at it now, you're kind of like, damn, there was some like fucked up stuff happening. But at the time we were just like, go, we love, we loved all of that. But anyways, all of that is to say that if you didn't see her season, I'm just going to give you a couple of bullet points here and we're going to move past it. 
Mariana was on cycle 21 of America's Next Top Model, and this was in 2015. And she was the youngest on the cast and the shortest on the cast, which is ironic because she was five, nine and a half, which is still pretty tall. But, you know, in model terms, I guess it's not that tall. So she was on the show and she was the eighth model eliminated. And while on the show, she took like beautiful photos because she was just so naturally pretty. But she did end up getting like a, in a relationship with a guy on the cast because this was a season where there were both male and female models. And her relationship ended up kind of being the focal point of his and her time on the show. This and this like fake beard that they made this guy wear that I will never forgive them for or be able to get out of my mind because I was like why are you putting this like it looks so bad you know you know why why did they make that choice I, sometimes the models get the makeovers and it's just to make them struggle I'm telling you <laughs> but anyways after leaving America's Next Top Model she had plans to do things with her life she wanted to move forward she wanted to either be a Victoria's Secret model or maybe be an actress she just could feel deep inside of her that she was destined for bigger things she knew that she was either going to end up in New York or Los Angeles. Like these things, this was going to happen for her. She said she wanted to leave Charlotte as soon as she possibly could. But this didn't end up happening for her. She did continue to try to model for a while. She took some test shots and she even did some modeling for a couple of clothing companies, but it never really went farther than that for her. And she stayed in Charlotte. She got a new boyfriend. They had been together a couple months. This was Jonathan. Um, and she had just moved in with him when the two of them ended up being murdered. So now I'm going to start getting into the murders, but our story actually does not begin with Mariana's murder. Our story begins a couple of days earlier in a town about 10 miles over, which was Matthews, North Carolina. And I'm now going to introduce you to a whole new cast of players, a whole different group of people. We're going to be talking about Edward Sanchez, his new girlfriend, Emily Isaacs, Emmanuel Jesus Rongel, and David Lopez. And I can't remember the exact ages of these people, but it ranged anywhere from 18 to 22. It's February 22nd, 2015, and Emily, Edward, and Emmanuel are all hanging out doing drugs. They were all really into Xanax, and they had plans that day to meet up with another man. This is 22-year-old Razul Harrell, so that they could get more because he sold Xanax. And now apparently Edward used to have another connection to get his drugs. Like he was a pretty heavy user, so he got it, you know, kind of often he had somebody else, but the person he normally got drugs from was out. So Emily was like, oh wait, I've got this connect. Let me, let me text this guy. And she ends up getting in contact with Razul. So I guess they had bought Xanax from him a couple of times already, but on this day, the 22nd, they had other things in mind. They were planning to rob Razul of whatever he had because they said that they believed he was selling them bad drugs. This is what they, this is what they said. This is what they thought. So their plan was to go meet up with him under the guise of buying more Xanax. And once together, they were just going to, you know, take everything he had, rob him and leave, which sounds like a super, you know, great plan. Good idea, right? No, stupid. But this is what they were going to do anyway. So Emily gets in the car and she drives both Edward and Emmanuel. There's a lot of ease in this. Emily, Edward, Emmanuel. She drives them to a nearby motel, the Microtel Inn, because this is where the transaction is supposed to take place. So they pull into this motel and they're sitting there for about five minutes before Razul pulls up in his car and he parks next to them. And it's him in the driver's seat and his friend Zaki in the passenger seat. So Edward gets out of their car you know, Emily's car, the car that they drove in, he gets into the back seat of Razul's car. So it's Razul, Zaki with Edward in the back. And after a couple of minutes, Edward just opens fire in that car on Razul and Zaki. Edward jumps out of the car. He goes to the driver's side door. He rips Razul out of the car and just starts beating the crap out of him after he's already shot him, right? And it's at this point that Emmanuel sees what's happening. He jumps out of the car that he's in. He runs over. He gets in the back seat of the car and just starts beating the crap out of Zaki until he's unconscious. Once Zachy was unconscious, Emmanuel got out of that car and went over to where Edward was beating Razul. He goes, he takes the gun off of Razul because Razul had a gun with him. He steals his gun and shoots him two times while he was laying on the ground, killing him. He had a total of three gunshots, two from Emmanuel and one from Edward. And it's just so sad, man, because I read that Razul's girlfriend saw part of this. I guess she had been in the motel that they were meeting up at and she like ran out to give him his cell phone and she saw part of what happened. And that just sounds so traumatizing. I'm not sure how much she saw, hopefully not much, because that would just be so hard to witness. After doing all this, they then proceed to rob 
this man that they've just killed, they take all of his annex and they take two guns from him before they get in the car where Emily's waiting to drive off. And as she goes to drive off, Edward reaches across her with her gun and fires like three more shots into Razul's car where Zaki was. Then they just take off. But shortly after leaving, Edward realizes that, that him, the genius that he is, had left his wallet at the scene of the murder. But at this point, they can't go back. So they figure, I guess we'll just cross that bridge when we get to it. And they leave. So from there, they do a couple of things over the next day or so, but not too many things that were notable or worth including here. But one thing that they did that was notable is that they went to the mall so that they could buy ammunition for the guns that they had stolen off Russell. Well, they bought some and then they stole a little more, which I did not know that you could like steal ammunition. I don't know why, but I thought it was one of those things that they kept on like lock and key. Like they're not just going to have ammo out on the counter, out on the floor where you can go and buy it. I'm not sure the logistics of how this, um, thievery went down, but it just seems like it should be harder to steal ammo. Like, I feel like this 18, 19, 20 year old shouldn't be able to just like steal it, but I don't know. Okay. There's one more interesting thing that happened over the next day or so. And this actually leads us into introducing yet another person into the story. And this is David Lopez. So apparently David Lopez was friends with Emmanuel and David texted Emmanuel during this time. and was like, Hey, not Hey, Hey, would you like to come over and smoke some weed with me, my friend? And he was like, yes, I would. So Emily goes back to her boyfriend Edward's dad's house and she stays there while Edward and Emmanuel go over to David Lopez's house. So they're all there hanging out, chilling, not killing at this moment. And they're smoking weed. And this is when Edward and Emmanuel look at David and they're like, so we have a plan. We have an idea. We want to see if you're receptive to said plan. And David's like, tell me more. So the guys are like, so we know this guy named Jonathan and Jonathan has a lot of heroin. We're thinking we're going to go and rob him. Are you in? Keep in mind, in addition to all the heroin, he also has a lot of money. So don't worry, you will get paid. And David Lopez agreed. Now, Emily didn't go to this robbery. Apparently, she didn't even know that they were going to rob Jonathan. From what the reports say, Edward just told her, hey, we're going to go see another drug dealer named Jonathan and like get more drugs because we didn't get enough when we robbed and killed Razul. But she didn't know that they were going to go and kill him. But does it really matter? Because like she did already take part in another robbery and another murder. And what's wild about this, this is going to blow your mind. It blew my mind at least. I don't know about you. Emily and Edward barely knew each other, dude. Like she and him met in February, the month that all of this happened. I guess they met the day after Valentine's at a party and they like super, super hit it off. They started hanging out. They started smoking weed together. They started taking Xanax together. Cause I guess Emily had like an issue with Xanax, just like Edward did. She would take two a day. But then when she got with Edward, he became her drug supplier and she would take up to six a day. So it was just like a bad relationship. But well, I mean, it wasn't a good matching because now they're both like heavily into drugs and robbing and killing people. Right. It's just crazy to think that you can meet someone in such a short amount of time, do something so horrible together. Like that is always going to blow my mind a little bit, but moving on. It's February 24th. It's about 1 AM and Emmanuel drives himself, David and Edward over to a home in Charlotte, North Carolina. And this is the home of Jonathan Husmar and Mariana Puhar. Edward and Emmanuel get out of the vehicle, which was a truck. It doesn't matter, but I know that information. So I'm going to tell you, they go to the door and they knock. Someone let the two into the house. The door closed and they were inside while David was out in the car waiting. And after a couple of minutes, he started to hear gunshots ringing out into the night. He sat there, not sure what was going on, but after a couple of more minutes, Emmanuel came to the door and called David in. He didn't go in right away. He met them at the door and they started handing him stuff to take out of the car, like TVs, Xboxes, things like that. But once he finally did go inside, he saw the absolute carnage that these two men had created. Mariana Puhar was lying on the floor in a pool of blood near the front door. Like to me, it sounds like she might have been trying to run. She was shot twice, once in the neck and once in the back through her shoulder. Her boyfriend, Jonathan, was lying in the kitchen and he had been shot through the back of his head. And Jonathan's roommate, who's Mara, which the overkill here, man, I don't understand. He was shot eight times. He was shot six times in the head and upper back and once in the arm and once in the leg. And he was laying face down in the bedroom. It's just so sad, dude, but that's what they did. And then after this, they left and they drove off together so that they could go and divvy up the items that they had stolen, which consisted of cash, a bunch of boxes of like brand new shoes, like Air Jordans. There was jewelry, the TV, the Xbox, um, an iPad and a package of heroin. So Edward and Emmanuel kept all of the items and David was given $300 for being their driver. 
Now, the murders took place on the 24th, but their bodies weren't actually found for a couple of days later. And how they were recovered was reported differently in different sources. Like, on, I saw on TMZ, which I believe is the source that I used, like, way back in the day, which is not, like, the best source. But I read that it said that a friend of the people who lived in the house, like, heard the shots or heard about the shots and went over and went inside and saw what happened and called the police. But then I saw a totally different account of what happened um, from a much more reputable source. And this source said that it was actually Edward's dad. Edward's dad called police and was like, listen, my son was involved in two robberies and several murders. And at the time, the police didn't even know that Mariana, Jonathan, and Uzmar were killed. So they hear this, they go over to the house, they go in, and they find that scene. So police enter the home at about 5.30 p.m. And they determine very quickly that drugs were involved at least in the murders they were a contributing factor to what happened here because of the home the fact that jonathan was one of the victims and he was allegedly known to be a heroin dealer and if that wasn't enough there were some things in the home that made them feel more certain about believing that this was the case inside they found the spent shell casings of a 38 caliber gun a box of nine millimeter ammunition they also recovered a quote marijuana like substance baggie as well as a brownish red colored plastic substance end quote and this was wrapped in like plastic and a metal spoon was nearby that was likely used to cook so like it does seem like the drugs definitely played a part here but that doesn't mean that they don't matter. You know what I mean? Like, that's what makes me so crazy is like, yes, people can do bad things or things that you don't agree with and still be good people and their lives can still matter. Crazy. <laughs> now for the record, um, it is said like across the board that Mariana herself was not into drugs. She was even said to be anti-drug, which is strange considering the situation that she found herself in in the house that she was living in. But everyone who knew her said she didn't actually do drugs herself. And she had even signed modeling contracts that said like she wasn't on drugs. But also for the record, even if she had been, it doesn't make her death less tragic. Um, Jonathan, Huzmar, Razul's, all of their deaths with Mariana's equally tragic. So now they have these two murder scenes and they don't know right off the bat that they are connected, but it doesn't take them long to put two and two together and see that they were committed by the same people. But now they just had to, you know, track them down and arrest them. So where were they? After committing the murders, Edward went back to his dad's house where Emily had been, you know, staying, waiting for him. And he went, he woke her up out of sleep and he's like, Hey, it's hot in Charlotte. We're going to leave right here right now. And we're going to head towards Texas so we can cross the border into Mexico. So they did, they left. And this was just Edward and Emily who left. Emmanuel did not join them. So they go, they get in the car, they drive and they drive for a while. They go like a thousand miles. They stay up in the mountains for a while before finally they do get into Texas. But that is where their journey ends really. I guess what happened is a Texas state trooper was sitting there just chilling, not killing. When a car passed him going a hundred miles per hour in a 55 zone, and this was on Interstate 10 um, near Houston. He pulled him over, of course, because like, you can't drive that fast. It is illegal. And when he ran the place, he found who the car was, you know, registered to and who was in the car. He realized that the people in the car were people who were wanted in connection with a murder, three murders rather, that took place in Charlotte, North Carolina. So he promptly arrested them and they were held in Texas at that time because that's where they were arrested. When the car was searched, that's when they were really screwed because first they found Roswell's gun, which effectively linked the case in Charlotte, in Charlotte to the case in Matthews. Now they know for sure, like, oh, these two cases are the same because this guy was definitely involved in the three murders in, in Charlotte. And now he was clearly connected in some way to the murders in Matthews. So that's bad. They also found ammo. They found heroin. They found um, boxes of shoes that were stolen from Jonathan after he was murdered. And even though he denied being involved, his pants and his shoes were bloodstained. And when the blood was tested, it was a match for Mariana. Now, the following morning, Emmanuel was arrested, and I believe he was arrested at his mom's house. I'm not 100% on that, but I do know that his mom's house was searched because he had been there. I guess he, like, showed up with a bunch of stuff and, like, slept through the day and, like, hung out there. So police come. They arrest him. They search the house. They find the TV that was stolen. They find the Xbox that was stolen. They find the shoes that had been stolen from Jonathan, all those sneakers, which, by the way, when Emmanuel went home, he, like, took all these sneakers and started offering them for free to his family members. And we know this because Emmanuel's mom actually went and spoke to police voluntarily, and she told them that he did this. Now, why did this happen? Why did they target Jonathan's house specifically? His, Jonathan's, stepfather did speak out with his theory as to why this happened. And he thinks it's because these men wrongly believed 
that Jonathan had more money than he did. Because I guess just like a week before, Jonathan had gone to a car dealership that was owned by Emmanuel's father and he had bought a car for $1,500 in all cash. So they believed he had money because he had all this cash to just buy a car. On top of that, Jonathan and Uzmar were kind of flashy with the things that they did have. Like they would post photos online of a bunch of money, you know, cash and cash boxes. And Jonathan often bought designer clothes and, and designer shoes. But his stepfather said he just did this because he wanted to look nice. He wanted to dress smart. He said that Jonathan was a good kid, that he had been working hard at like painting and repairing houses and that he had saved up for a long time to be able to go out and buy that car. Like that's why he had that money so that he could go and buy that car and that he just liked to dress smart, that he warned him like he needed to be careful and not look like he had too much money because he could, you know, attract the wrong attention. But he said like Jonathan was 23 years old with a beautiful girlfriend and he just wanted to like look nice. So he looked like he had more money than he had. He also said that Jonathan and Mariana really loved each other. Despite only being together for six months, they were deeply in love. They had been talking about getting married. Um, Mariana and Jonathan's mom had gotten super, super close. Like everything between the couple seemed really, really good and really strong. It's just very, very sad. And after it was revealed that Mariana was one of the people who had been murdered, people were so heartbroken. So many people had a lot to say, even her like principal, which I don't know if this was from high school or if this was from middle school. I imagine it was from middle school because they had a lot of positive things to say. And I know it was said that Mariana had some issues in high school, but they said that she was like the epitome of the girl next door of like the good girl. She was always friendly and polite and had a smile. She would like help her dad wash his car. And she never let the fact that she had been on America's Next Time Model go to her head. She was very grounded. She was very real. And she was just like a wonderful person. And speaking of America's Next Top Model, everyone had something to say about her, man. After she was killed, every single person who had been on that show with her and her cast or people who just worked with the show and knew her spoke out about her after she was killed. Several of her cast members made posts about her after she was killed and a YouTube video was made where all of the America's Next Top Model members talked about her and remembered her. A GoFundMe account was set up for funeral expenses and many of them donated money and even Tyra herself spoke out saying that she had chills knowing what happened and offered up all the thoughts and prayers to her loved ones. Denzel spoke out about her too. You know, the guy that I said she had had a romance with while on America's Next Top Model? He made a post about her too where he said, quote, I loved and cared about you. And although you knew, I regret, I waited one day too late to tell you, I loved and cared about you. And it's actually kind of sad because Mariana did an interview after she was on America's Next Top Model and she was asked about Denzel specifically. And she said that, you know, she really cared about him. She really liked him, but they were so far away. Like they lived in completely different places and it would have been um, like a very long distance relationship and it wasn't something that she was looking to get into at that time. But then she said, quote, if I move to LA and he moves to LA, we're definitely going to make something happen. Or if I move to New York and he moves to New York, then we're definitely going to make something happen. Which that's sad, right? I mean, she was in a relationship and it did sound serious. So I guess it's not that sad, but it is also sort of sad because it just, it's a lot of possibilities. You know, it's a lot of things that could have happened for her that didn't because she was murdered. And that's just very sad across the board. After she was killed, many people also shared this video of Mariana all over social media. You can find it. If you search her name, it will come up. And in this video, she was talking about her hopes and her dreams and things she wanted for her future and just the future in general. And in this video, she said, quote, I have a dream that one day will spread more love than hate. That's my dream. That's it. And then something else, one other thing that, ooh, when I read this, it really like kind of got under my skin and gave me the heebie-jeebies. So like shortly before she was killed, Mariana posted a photo of her and Tyra Banks together. And it was the caption that just made me feel so uncomfortable. In this caption, she said, quote, our time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. And something about that just gave me all of the feels. And I think it's because she talks about her time being limited and hers like literally ran out. I don't know that that got to me. Maybe it won't get to you, but it got to me. So back to the people who did this, I couldn't find any information on David being arrested, like any of the specifics of his arrest and how it came to be, but he was arrested as well. Obviously he took part in this. So they were all arrested. And then Edward and Emily were sent from Texas back to North Carolina. So they were all together in one place and now they could all, well, not now they could all be charged, but they were all charged. Edward was charged with four counts of first degree murder and one count of attempted murder. Emmanuel was charged with four counts of first degree murder and one count of attempted murder. 
David was charged with three counts of first degree murder and Emily was initially charged as an accessory, but it was eventually raised to first degree murder when they discovered more information during their investigation. Now, when police looked into the backgrounds of the individuals involved, there wasn't anything really that noteworthy in their past. Like they had some minor things for like drugs and things like that, but nothing that would kind of make you think that this could be the path they would end up going down, except for maybe Emmanuel would be the exception to that. Now, I'm not fully going to go into the next part because it has to do with border laws and immigration. And I know that people have very strong feelings about that. And I don't really want to open up the comment section to a bunch of ugliness. Like that's not really the vibe I try to bring here. You know what I mean? But it does come into play with this case. So I'm going to give you like the bare minimum, the bullet points and then move past it. Emmanuel being involved in this murder became a big national debate when Republicans in Congress brought up the fact that technically he shouldn't have been in the country and was sort of here on a technicality or mistake. Basically, he was going to be deported. The process was stopped, though, because uh, he was approved for a two year amnesty under Obama's deferred action for childhood arrivals policy. The program was set up for undocumented immigrants who entered the country before June of 2007 when they were 16 or younger, and it protects them. It's obviously deeper than that, like laws generally are, but that's the gist of it. So basically what happened is it's been said that he should not have been granted this protection because he had a bit of a checkered past, which involved some gang activity. And basically people, some people say that he was allowed this protection while the people who gave him the protection knew full well that he had this history and that they just did it anyway. And then the other side's like, we had no idea, obviously, or this wouldn't have been the case. But it was confirmed that he was in the drug database for previous charges. He had charges um, for assaulting a 30 year old woman and he did have gang ties. And I guess even after he was arrested, his mother like went into protection for her own safety. So that's that's kind of what's going on with him and them and the criminal histories. Now, initially, the state was considering the death penalty for this case, but I guess that area in the state and that state just in general, has kind of cooled to the idea of the death penalty. So they only use it under very extreme circumstances, like very, you know, I don't know how they make the call when it comes to murder. Like this one's bad. This one's not so bad. I don't know how they make that call, but they did decide not to go after the death penalty in this case. Now I'm going to start going through the defendants and I'm going to go through each one of them individually because they didn't have like the same trials and the same situations or the same outcome. So the first one to go to trial was Edward. Now, during Edward's trial, there was a ton of evidence against him. First, there was the fact that the gun used to kill Razul that he stole from him was under the passenger seat in the car when he was arrested. There was also heroin hid inside of a fuzzy, like stuffed animal, like a toy that was in the glove compartment. Xanax was in the center console and he had Mariana's blood on his jeans and his Ralph Lauren boots, which fancy Ralph Lauren boots. David also testified and the court heard his account of what happened, how he was waiting out in the car, how he heard all the gunshots, how they called him to the door. And when he went inside, he saw both Emmanuel and Edward looting everything they could, like taking everything they could from this house after they had just killed three people. And of these things that were taken were all of those, you know, expensive new shoes, which they found several of those pairs inside Edward's car when he was arrested. Emily also testified against him and she was able to be an eyewitness to Razul's murder and the attempted murder of Zaki. She said that she had no idea they were going to kill anybody, that she was there. She heard the shots. She saw what they did. And even if that wasn't enough, they also had Edward's wallet at the scene of the murder. So they didn't even really need her. She just kind of strengthened what they already had to explain why that wallet was there. So he couldn't be like, oh, my wallet was stolen. Like, no, your girlfriend said, like, you dropped it when you were killing people, you dick. So the trial lasted a little over a week and the jury was sent to deliberate. And during the entire case, the entire, you know, proceeding, the right side of the courtroom was just filled with family and friends who were just crying day after day. And people had showed up for Edward initially, but by the end of the trial, like the people that were there for him were mostly like all out. They were like, Oh, this is, these are the details. I think, um, maybe I made the wrong choice in sitting and defending you. After only 90 minutes of deliberation, the jury returned with their verdict. They had found Edward Sanchez guilty of all of the charges against him, and he was automatically given life in prison without the possibility of parole for each of the murder convictions and an additional 13 years for the attempted murder. And all of these were to be served consecutively. So next to go to trial was Emmanuel. And apparently like the first day of his 
like the first time he appeared in court was super, super tense because apparently Emmanuel knew Uzmar. Like he, they were familiar. So like the families knew each other. It was a little bit like that's, that's complicated. You know what I mean? And I guess like he did his first hearing and then when he was going to be let out by the guards, uh, Uzmar's family was filling like the entire third row and he went to walk past them. He stopped. He like looked at them and made prolonged eye contact with them. And it was super eerie because I guess he knew a lot of the people that were there. And then after he was let out, two women who had been there, like completely lost it, broke down and got hysterical at what had just happened. Emmanuel pled not guilty, but just like his friend before him, they had a lot of evidence against him, at least in one of the murders. Even though he was charged with four counts of first degree murder and one count of attempted murder, he was actually only found guilty of the murders of Jonathan, Uzmar, and Mariana. He was actually found not guilty of the murder of Razul and the attempted murder of Zaki. Emmanuel did try to appeal his conviction. He said that like he had ineffective counsel and that the prosecutor said some things during their either opening or closing statement that could, you know, prejudice the jury. But the court, the court, the appeals court, um, rejected his appeal. He also tried to imply or tried to suggest that it was unfair that like the trials had been put together because like the murders in Charlotte and the murder in Matthews, they were all tried at the same time. And he thought that it shouldn't have been that way. But the court respectfully disagreed. Now, as for David and Emily, I am going to kind of combine them a little bit because they, they were seen as being less involved, which I guess arguably they were less involved, but they still did some like pretty awful things. You know what I mean? Like they were both charged with their crimes, but they were also seen as just being accessories instead of being responsible for the murders. And they were also cooperating with police. So they were kind of given like lighter punishments. I guess David voluntarily went to police to be interviewed and then he was arrested. And though he was initially charged with the three Charlotte murders in 2018, he ended up pleading guilty to armed robbery and accessory to first degree murder. And he was sentenced to at least 10 years or no, what he, what he will spend at least 10 years in prison and then he is going to be deported. That's what the situation is with him. And I think he got this as like a plea deal because he did testify against Emmanuel and Edward. Now, as for Emily, she pled not guilty to all of her charges. And it does seem like the court at least believed her, believed that she wasn't that involved. Um, she was also, it's worth mentioning, like the only female and the only person who was white. Take with that what you will. I don't know if it matters, but I did notice it um, because her and David kind of did the same things. And David's getting a harsher punishment than she is. And um, that could be a female thing. It could be a white thing. It would be foolish to not think that that could have something to do with something. That's all I'm going to say as a white woman, I think I would probably be treated better than my husband if we were put in the exact same situation. Okay. Okay. Her attorney told the court that Emily had essentially been swept away by one of the defendants, which was Edward, her boyfriend, and that he had completely started controlling her life from the moment they got together. Now, though her attorney did hope she'd get no time, she did end up being sentenced to four years in prison, which means that I believe she, sh she should be out by now, right? Yeah. She should be released at this time. So that's what's going on with her. She did apologize in court, but Razul's mother was not having it. She said that Emily is just as guilty as the others and that she acts like she had nothing to do with it, but she is the person who drove the two men to the location to murder her son and then drove them away afterwards, which I get why she feels that way, man. I'm very curious as to what you guys think. How do you feel about the whole situation? Do you feel like she should have gotten more time? Do you have compassion for her because of the situation she was in? Let me know all your thoughts below and let me know why you think David got more time than she did. Cause I am genuinely curious about that. Cause I feel like it's one of those things that we could really talk about politely because we're allowed to have different opinions without being like mean to each other. We don't have to be dicks about it. We could just like talk. Now, as far as the aftermath goes, I'm not sure how the families are doing. I didn't see any reports about anyone's family, but Mariana. And at the time of the report I saw, they were mourning their loss at their East Charlotte home. Um, they had a lot of ties there with the community and a lot of friends. So, I mean, it's possible that they're still there, though I could see it being very difficult to see, to like stay in a location where you so close to where your child had been killed. It's got to be so hard for them to like have, for all of them, have your child there and then have them be gone the very next minute. And where Mariana's family's concerned, they were just seeing her like trying to get her life together, like going down a dark path and trying to improve herself. And then this happened. Her friend Belle said that that's part of why this whole situation was just so shocking because Mariana seemed like so ready to make her place in the world. She wanted to leave Charlotte as soon as possible. Mariana said she felt like a big fish in a little pond and she was just going with the flow 
seeing where life took her. She was happy. She had no regrets. And she said that just everything happens for a reason. And with that, that my friends is the story of the North Carolina killing spree that took the lives of four young people. I hope that you found this to be informative and it made sense and it gave you all the details that you would want when looking into this case. And of course, I want to thank you for remembering Mariana, Jonathan, Usmar, and Razzle with me today. Now, considering all the information I gave you, I want to revisit the question of the day. And that was this. Do you believe that the sentences that were given to those involved were justice? Do you feel like everyone got enough time for the crimes that they committed. Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. Before you leave, please don't forget to leave me a comment down below letting me know what case you'd like to see me cover in the future. I have a long list of cases and every time you leave a suggestion, I put it on my list with your name next to it. So if I cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love looking into the cases that you guys suggest because they're often cases that I haven't heard of or just cases that need more coverage. And I know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell. I put out a new video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically, you. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below along with a link to my membership where you can get early access to non-sponsored videos, priority comment responses, things like that. I want to say one more thank you to Skillshare for partnering with me on today's video. It's partners like Skillshare that make it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock. Don't ever change. And now with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here. When you could literally be anywhere else in the world, that is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video. Bye. <laughs>